The doctrine of America First is here to stay. As we've seen even in the first month of a new administration, America First's electoral popularity and strategic accomplishments ensure that it no longer belongs to a single party or politician. By successfully realigning U.S. foreign policy with the interests of the American people, America First is now positioned to guide our country through the trials and tribulations of the next generation. Once unleashed, this doctrine has shown it won't easily be tossed aside. The American people demanded a part in the democratic process of formulating foreign policy. Once they got it, they won't ever let it go, ever. Previous administrations have tried to limit the American people's participation in deciding what kind of foreign policy this country should pursue. They delegated it to unelected technocrats and career bureaucrats with the help of lobbyists and others with financial interests overseas. The overclassification of government documents, the over-reliance on special operation forces, the over-expansion of new and overlapping federal agencies, and the over-politicized nature of intelligence all help to take national security off the table as a matter for democratic debate. There is still a group of foreign policy, foreign policy professionals who want to restore this old way of doing things. They tell us we can't understand the complicated issues, so they don't share all of the information with us. They tell us other countries will fail and fall if we don't send more U.S. troops. They tell us they can solve our problems by creating more government programs, and they tell us there will be another war in the Middle East if we move our embassy to Jerusalem. But they lie to us, and they think we don't see it. But fortunately for us, these so-called experts are not very creative or innovative. Try as they might, they won't take back control of the information, the budgeting, and the decision-making, because it is our right as voters to participate in this process. When I was first announced as the presidential envoy for Kosovo and Serbia, I was told by all the experts in D.C. who to speak to, who not to speak to, how to define the problems, and what were the available solutions. People had worked on this issue for 20 years with little to no progress, wanted to define the problems and set the boundaries for me. They wanted to control the available options. So instead, I spoke to people on the ground, business leaders in Belgrade and Pristina, who create jobs, reporters from the region who cover the issues up close, officials who have staked their lives and credibility on what for them are life and death issues. And what they all told me was to forget the intractable political problems that dominate headlines in Washington, D.C. and Brussels. Instead, they told me, concentrate on economics, concentrate on jobs, opportunity, education, upward mobility, and the free flow of people and goods. If I had listened to the experts in D.C. and Brussels, who never would have made, we never would have made the breakthrough of 2020, the first economic normalization agreement in a generation. The same was true for my time in Germany. I was counseled by all the experts not to push too hard, even though they were building gas pipelines with Russia reducing their contributions to NATO while having a surplus themselves and making more deals with China. But these so-called experts in Washington see and think in black and white as either being too hard or too soft, as being too mean or too nice. Real progress takes place not in black and white, but in living color, a concept that all 
ordinary Americans know, from their everyday lives as parents, friends, business owners, and employees. We didn't ask the Germans to be better allies because of some rigid ideological principle. We simply understood that the United States and Europe share the Western values of security, peace, and free trade. And so it was reasonable to ask our European allies to share certain burdens with us. We expected them to cut rather than grow their dependence on Russian gas. And we wanted them to renegotiate trade agreements to make our relationship more balanced and fairer. For some reason, this was counterintuitive to all the experts, but not to the people. The lesson here is that the outsiders always have something to say, always something to contribute. Whether they're trying to make their voices heard in Washington, D.C., Brussels, or Sacramento. There are a few ways to leverage the contributions of outsiders. In America, I think there is a real value in seriously considering term limits for our elected officials. Now, let me be clear, I sympathize with the counter intellectual argument. The term limits constrain the public's freedom to vote for whomever they want. I get it. But the reality of our current political system should compel us to rethink how these intellectual justifications run counter to our lived experience. I believe the time has come to limit the terms for our House and Senate leaders. Many who have become more ingrained in Washington and in the fabric of their own hometowns. And this is not a matter of concern for just Republicans, but it includes Democrats. This is a fight between the insiders and the outsiders, between Washington, D.C., and the rest of America. Of course, if things get really bad with elected officials, there's always the option to recall them. If you want the best case possible for a recall campaign, take a look at my home state of California. California used to be Reagan country. The shining example of business innovation and middle-class success. But now when you think of California, you think of out-of-control wildfires, of rolling blackouts, of schools still closed, of shuttered businesses, of bans on fracking, and wealthy people jumping the vaccine line. Did you know that Gavin Newsom, the California governor, originally purchased $1 billion of masks and other protective equipment from a Chinese company. When American companies with the same equipment were based in California. In my three decades in American politics, I have never seen a better case for a recall than there is right now in California. And of course, if a public official is still failing to deliver on their promises, and if you can't limit their term or recall them in time, there's always one other option. You can run against them yourself. Thank you very much.